The Speaking from Experience Entrepreneurship Lecture Series, sponsored by Champlain College's BYO Biz Program, brings leading entrepreneurs to campus where they share their experience and wisdom with Champlain students and the local community. Tonight, we are proud to present Hinda Miller, co-founder of Jogbra. Good evening, everybody. Hello, Pat. Um, welcome to Speaking from Experience. Uh, tonight, we have a great program uh, for you, and I thank you all for coming. And a particular thanks uh, to our first Speaking from Experience speaker, who is with us tonight, Wynn Smith, the owner of the
success. And even though Jagra happened in the 1970s, which is ancient history, the principles behind innovation, passion, hard work are all the same. So I'm hoping that this story won't feel like ancient history. I'm hoping that you can take these words and overlay it on all the projects that you're doing now and as you envision the future to be. So um, I'm going to be talking about the seeds of success. And they're really very simple. They have to do with how we speak, how we act, and how we think. These are universal in the 70s, and they're going to be universal as long as humankind is on the planet. I'm going to talk about some universal laws of nature. One of them is the law of give and take, <coughs> as it pertains to adding value in a business or a service or to your family or to your community. The next law I'm going to talk about is the law of correspondence, which means that if you think good thoughts moving forward in the universe, those things are going to come back. If you think negatively, those things are going to come back too. So all the success starts on the earth, goes to the heavens, with these very simple universal laws. And the last one is the law of correspondence. That everything has a correspondence and everything is connected. So let me um, sort of describe these uh, in the story of Jagra. And also, um, I guess I have to add the next chapter of my particular life story, which is uh, politics. And I want to thank uh, the people in Champlain College who made really a spectacular poster as they were given information about me. And it, and it says, um, power patent to politics. So after reading that, I thought, well, there's a lot of power of P. What is the, what is the sound of P? What is the power of P? And in Kabbalah, the power of P means eternal words that forever shape the future. So I'm going to move from this wonderful creative poster into P and how it moves us along, all of us. So, power of an idea, of creative energy from the right brain intuition that comes from down here, power of inspiration and innovation as all of you are innovating for the future. As you look at your life and you say, this doesn't work, I'm gonna do something differently. And that's the beginning, the beginning of whatever you are going to do. And that certainly was the beginning of Jock Rock. Um, so patent, uh, patent is an interesting word too, because patent means that you have to state your purpose. When you apply for a patent, you have to state your purpose. You have to describe it. You have to detail it. And you need to protect it. Um, and I have to say that we did get some patents and it was very helpful because Nike Canada tried to steal the chakra and we were just two years in business and we wrote a letter or a lawyer wrote a letter that said, cease and desist. I don't even think we knew what that was, but for some reason they didn't copy our product because we had the patent. So I'm going to tell you about the chakra patents because they're, they're unusual. Chakra was the first sports bra. And I guess I can go to the age when we didn't have sports bras and many of us were running. Uh, we just graduated the college and we were full of this sister energy and we were gonna prove ourselves in the world and we were running like this, we were very self-conscious, but the endorphins of the brain made us strong in body and strong in spirit. And we needed something, those of us who were medium framed, um, to hold ourselves in. And that was, why isn't there a jock strap for women? That was the segue into a world of incredible learning, passion, and really adding value to women's lives. Because the mission of Jagra was that every woman and girl, no matter what their size or age, were 
able to have the benefits, or they had the right for the benefits of exercise and fitness. And so that was our moving force, that we wanted to give women a product, which we called a piece of equipment, uh, because we weren't some flimsy, sexy bra that had been designed by men. We were women who were into function and performance and achievement. So the first kind of patent we got was a utility patent. And that is granted very rarely, and I'm sure some of you will be doing something so new, so a new category. So the sports bra was a new category. There was no bra for sports. So we applied for a utility patent. And any of you who design or invent in the first of a category, you can go for a utility patent. And then, of course, the design patent, which talks about the seams and what it looks like. But that's easy to change because seams change and you can have the same product. But the utility patent was an amazing feat, and we're still proud of that. Um, and then the, I'm going to get back to the rock, the, the jog rock story, but politics. So here's what the, someone said. Geithner, Tim Geithner said that um, it's not what you can it's not what you believe, it's what you can achieve. That's what he has said about politics. Politics are the art of possible, and they also tend to be a little bit of sausage making, which we will get to later. Possibilities of imagination and other principles, I think, that guide us all that are going out there and creating our own path. Um, the courage, the courage to go into the unknown, and I think that the only way um, we muster courage of the unknown is that we, we know that everything that's put in front of us is to teach us a lesson. It's not to put us down, it's not to make us feel stupid, it's not humiliation. It's just those things are presented <coughs> to open our eyes. So I think all of us can have beginner's mind as we start new transitions in our lives, new jobs, new education, whatever it is. It's about the gift of the beginner's mind. What is a beginner? They don't mind asking questions. They, they know what they don't know. And they don't mind being in a state of unease until they get to a place of knowledge. I think that's really, really important for all of us. And, and those of us who have many transitions in our lives, we often find ourselves in this beginner mind state. And of course, everything happens for a reason, along that same. Everything in the universe is presented to us so that we can open our eyes to the next thing we have to learn. And um, the other thing about opportunity, I think it's, we need to have an attitude of gratitude when things come to us. Because think of all the things that have to be in place for an opportunity to come to us. So often you see people say, no, I'm not going to do this. No, no. And I often wonder, don't they realize how things have to, all the conditions have to come together for that opportunity for them to say yes. So I, you can tell my kids, my wonderful kid Macy, <coughs> my son Noah and my husband um, Joel and Macy's way better here. So I always say, go for it. Do it, you can handle it. Go to the next step, keep going, keep going. And I think that's what happened with Jogra. Jogra was such an important product. It had energy beyond us. And I, I did it with the partner. There were three of us in the beginning. Um, and we had this idea that why is there a job strap for women? We were up at the Champlain Shakespeare Festival. I was designing costumes. <coughs> we were all running, like three, five miles a day. It was a very, very important part of our life and our day. And um, so we said, wait a minute, wait a minute. That's what we want to do. Guys have been pulling everything close to the body. That's what we want to do. So this is a very true story. It's such a beautiful story, and I, I'm just the translator of this story. That um, I was a costume designer by trade. So the idea of sewing two job straps together wasn't crazy. We didn't have any judgments about it, like you can't do it. We didn't know how to design a bra. We had no idea. 
So there was absolutely no limitations for us. So we went to UVM, and I don't know if you guys still wear jock straps. <laughs> but back then at UVM, you could buy jock straps. So in the store we went, we bought two jock straps, and as you can tell, the one cup here, we sewed another cup in the wide band. We crossed the butt straps in the back because we had very strict design criteria. Straps couldn't fall down. We couldn't have seams to eat into our skin because in the beginning, women would run and their, and their nipples would bleed because there was too much friction and seams would get embedded in their body. So we did an inside out product. So form, followed function, and we were not, we also found, or found out later that men had been designing bras forever. They had the fantasy of the women, and then they went out, and they went up, and they did this and that. That was not good for running. So we as women decided we were going to get our own thing. So I brought this, this, this is, you can imagine, this is one of the original jog bras, but you can see that you have the two things, the white band, the cross, and this was our original thing. We asked our friends to try it out, and they said, do this, do this. Put the seam away from the nipple, because it's rubbing on the nipple. This was like common sense. We said, look, this is, for, this, is gonna, this is gonna be good for you. And the story was that I put the first sample on, I ran forward, uh, no, Lisa ran forward, my partner. I was running backwards, watching her breasts. And I said, I don't think they're moving. How does it feel? She said, it feels good, it feels good. So we made some of these in the costume shop up there and we had our friends do it and they said you know do this do that market research which you guys do online and you do amazing things we were you know grassroots does this work are you running better do you feel more secure so this product became small medium and large it was packaged in a black box because we were so very serious that it was a piece of equipment this was not a pink frilly thing we put it into sporting goods stores, little mom and pops, because our mantra was, you only need a good pair of shoes designed for women and a bra, and then you can go run. And so we trained, eventually when we got a little more sophisticated with our selling, we trained the salespeople that when you sell a woman a pair of shoes, you do an add-on purchase and you sell her a bra. And um, our biggest account was Lady Footlocker, and the guy, Jim Harrington, I still remember, they called him Jock Rock Jim because he increased his sales by that hat on when he rock. And this is what women are wearing now. So it's an evolution. This actually is a Jock Rock product. Jock Rock was sold to Champion, but they never messed with the integrity of this product. So I'm sure some of you know this product well. So um, the... Uh, Let me say this. Um, one of the things that we did in starting a product, it, our company, is that we had a philosophy of fake it till you make it. Now that wasn't lying, that was, <coughs> we're moving quickly, we don't exactly know what we have or what we're doing, we have a new product, no one knows what the product is, so we're making this up as we go along, and I hope that each of you have a chance in your life to do something that no one has ever done before, that you can create your own decisions, your own creative path, because that's what uh, we did at Jock Rock. So fake it till you make it. We, we, we were with big corporations in the sales, in a, in the sales meeting, so we, we always said, oh yeah, we're, we're a big company in Vermont, and you know, we were in Lisa's living room, and et cetera, et cetera. But we were there, we showed up, and um, we had to teach people. So we had, the, we, had, we had a couple of things. We had so much respect for our consumer, who were us. We wanted to give them all the information. We were the first product that did little arrows. I don't know those of you who are into functional active wear. I don't know. They're still doing it. But in 1977, when you said the seam is away from the breast because it doesn't hurt the breast. The seams are to the outside so they don't rub against it. We want to tell our consumer everything about the design. And since we were the consumer and since we respected our friends and we were doing it for our sisters who were running, we sort of transformed that and we chose sporting goods stores and we taught men 
have the teeth had been sell bras, but they were small, medium, and large. So I said, look, just look at the woman. She's either small, medium, or large. It's just like a t-shirt. No problems. Don't get nervous. And so we were able to get in there and, 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 and do a category that had full markup, that was an add-on sale, <coughs> that was a destination, made sporting goods stores a destination for women. So as you know, the whole give and take, the law of give and take. You can't get anything unless you give something. We gave to these stores an opportunity to market to women, to say that they cared about women, they knew about good women's products, and they catered to women. And they gave us the opportunity to sell in our product. And sort of cosmically, when you look at the law of give and take, you know, when you give something, you create a vacuum. And then things rush in to fill that vacuum. And that is the energy of give and take. And you can apply that to service to others. And in fact, we felt that we were serving women. We had passion. We were passionate about women. And I, we, I am, we still are. Um, and we were passionate that exercise was, was going to improve their lives. So that drove us and kept us working and working and doing those type of things. So um, I wanted to just talk a little bit about education. As David, I didn't know David did so much homework about me, but in any case, I did go to Parsons School of Design and Environmental Design, then NYU for Costume Design. And people would ask me, um, well, how is it that you were uh, successful in business when you were a costume designer? And I, I thought about that, and I, I have a very serious answer to give back. And that is that in theater design or costume design, creativity is the most valued quality. If you're creative, you are honored. If you think outside the box, you have honor. And so you, you gravitate to do things creatively. You also work with the budget. You work with a lot of egos. You work with the director, the designer, the lighting designer, the actors. So you have a group of egomaniacs, just like senior management teams. You have to get the job done. You have opening night. You have a budget. You have to prioritize. And you have to get along with people and get the work done at a certain time. So in hindsight, it was a magnificent uh, education for the cycle and process of what it means to, to give birth to something in business or anything for that matter. So I like, I, I draw about for creativity, that's what I say. Um, so uh, I told you the story, the jobs. Oh yes, now here's another thing that is amazing. And don't forget, I'm just a messenger. My ego has left the story of Jock Bus. It's so old, it's like a dream, and I'm so pleased to share this dream with you. But um, when I was in New York, I uh, studied co uh, costume design, and we went to the Met, to the Metropolitan Museum of Art in, in their costume collection, and we were lucky enough to go and see old costumes and uh, draw farthingales and bustles, and it was clear in our teachings that Women's underwear was a great indication of the political, social, and economic status of women of that time. So when I designed the job bra, I said, this is a very important piece of underwear. It's a very important for the history of women. So I happened to have that wonderful opportunity to know the, the um, curator of the, of the, of the costume collection. I sent her the job bra, and I said, this is a very important piece of American underwear, blah, 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 women, feminism, you know, whatever. In any case, she accepted it. So our job, our original job, was somewhere in the catacombs of the costume collection. And it's in the Smithsonian Museum as well. And in the Smithsonian, I've never, it's, it's not on display, so you can't go see it. It's not like Sai Bellucci's uh, bumblebee costume or anything. It's in a drawer somewhere. But it says, American 1977 jogging bra. So it has its place as an evolutionary product, depicting where we were, the boomers were, when we were young, as we set off to our lives. So that's sort of thrilling as a designer to be part of that. And um, 
So, let me take a drink. And I guess I should, if you're interested about the um, capitalization of this new uh, company, which we got a $5,000 loan, loan from my dad. And then um, we made 40 dozen bras. I was in South Carolina teaching, I was a costume, I was an assistant professor of costume design at the University of South Carolina for about two years. We found a woman in a trailer. I brought her one product, like not two drop straps together, but close. And I said, I'm a medium. Could you make small and large? And so she did that. And we sold like a dozen bras in New York, a bras in Burlington, and my partner went to California and did a dozen bras. So they sold out. We did a little package. And so SBA said, give us your sales history. I said, well, what do you mean? They said, well, we sold, you know, a dozen here, a dozen there. They sold out, we priced it. And um, that was, the, the SBA at that time was during Carter's time. And for those of you, you we're now experiencing the worst <coughs> depression that we've ever been in. But in Carter's time, which was the late 70s, we had um, interest rates of 22%. Now, we didn't know that was, not good, but it wasn't good. But the thing that Carter did was that he had actual physical money in the Small Business Administration, and it was for minority-owned businesses. Now, in Vermont, we didn't have a lot of diversity, so two women owning 50-50 a business, we had the ability to apply, and we got an actual check of $50,000. Your tax dollars went into our business, and we created, you know, 200 jobs in our history here from 1977 to 1990. And 1990, we sold dog bra. And at that point, it was a, we had bras for every size woman and for every sport. We had some uh, athletic wear. Um, and we had a national and international brand. Because women who came to marathons, they said, what is this? Can you take the column? Can you take it? You know, and it spread kind of underground not like a big corporation, but you know, they were our friends. And that was the other thing, it was such a great time. Friendship, and we were young, and we, we were exercising, and we felt that we could do anything. And um, I'm hoping that you guys feel that way as well. Um, your world is so different, but the qualities um, that I described um, cannot be replaced by technology, or Twitter, or Facebook, or anything, because they come, from inside and they make us human and they allow us to have relationships and still, no matter what, you have to create relationships. Even if you have the ability to keep them online, you must be able to connect to the heart and you have to add value. And so that was sort of, so we, we sold when, um, you know, oh, I forget that, and we did sell, yes, we sold. We sold because, um, we needed the next round of money and we were burned out and we, we saw that sports bras were a commodity. They weren't special. Everyone was doing sports bras, the big companies did, and we felt that for Jog Bra to grow, we sold it, we sold it to Playtex, then Playtex sold to Sarah Lee. So I became a suit with Sarah Lee, and one thing I learned, or one thing I want to share with you, I don't know if it's true, but I learned it that as soon as we uh, sold to this big corporation, they did all this market research, and I thought, oh my God, like we didn't do market research, we just did what we felt was right. $200,000 later with market research and focus groups and everything, I could see the report and I said, well, I could have told you that. <laughs> so I want you to know that your instincts are good, and if you can express them, and if you can outline your assumptions, so you bring someone from here to there, and you create the whole story. So they can't say, well, I know better than you, because it's not their story. It's not their vision, and it's not their product. So as you guys go into the world for your jobs, or you speak to bankers, or whatever, you create the assumptions, because don't forget, my partner used to call them financial fairy tales. That you're supposed to project three years out what's gonna happen with your business. So eventually you think, well, I know just as well as the bankers or my accountants or my board of directors. I have the story and I'm sticking to it. So go deep, trust your instincts, and then fill it out with facts, right? Facts. Okay, so um, how am I doing with time? Okay, so um, I, one thing I'm very proud of 
that um, we were mostly a women-owned company. We'd never been in business before. My partner and I had a very fiery relationship, and we knew that we had to get some principles that would hold us together. What they call this now is corporate culture. So in 1982, or 80, 82, we said, look, we're spending 10, 12 hours a day together. How are we going to spend our time? What kind of principles guide how we all think? So I'm going to read you these JBI, they're called JBI Operating Principles, and now you call them culture or corporate social responsibility, that's what you call it. But it's demonstrate gentleness, dignity, and respect, communicate with frankness, honesty, and clarity, avoid blame, that was a good one, keep agreements, because we were going so fast. And we were encur encouraging us and everyone to say, okay, you can't meet the de deadline, but tell people so we can adjust. Keep your agreements, and if you can't keep the agreement, then just say what's going to happen so we can keep going on. Assume good intentions, listen, and be receptive. Ask for help, that was a big one. You know, it depends how you've been brought up, like if you're brought up to be perfect, and you find yourself in a, in a place where you can't do something, by instinct and habit and lineage and how you were taught, you might not be able to ask for help. That's very detrimental in a very fast-growing organization, and in any organization. Asking for help is not a weakness, it's a strength. Because you show the weakness of what's happening, you get to get people around you to brainstorm to see how you do it better, and it usually shows a weakness in, your, in some area of your, of, so you have an obligation to ask for help. Not every day, but you have to ask for help. And it has to be okay. Avoid taking things personally. That was a big one. Um, that's, that to me is a law of neutrality. And I'm going to speak about that in politics. But the law of neutrality allows arm's length. That you're not emotionally attached to an agenda. You're not, you don't know the answer before the answer evolves from the group of people that is trying to do it. So Buddhists talk about neutrality that you look at things with an empty cup, and you look at it, and you examine it, and you're not all emotional and attached and opinionated and judging. You're that empty vessel. So that is what I say, avoid taking things personally. Take risks, learn, learn from what doesn't work, take ownership of outcomes, attack problems, not people, seek solutions. So this is almost one day now. But I have to say that, you know, 20, 25 people chugging along, uh, marketing a new product in a new industry, this was the glue. <coughs> and when I think back on Jagra, this is the important part. And we made little cards, people kept them in their wallet. I still have it, I still have it in my wallet. But I think um, this is a good segue into politics, because I thought, that, you know, I first went into politics in 2003. Two, I was campaigning. Three, I started. And Peter Welch was my leader, my pro tem. And I was so excited, a new group of people. And I thought, what kind of operating principles do they have here? And how am I going to fit into their world and their vision? <laughs> and I got a consultant ready. And Peter sort of said, yeah, yeah, right. And he finally said to me, said, Linda, we don't have operating principles in politics. We are only responsible to our constituents. We can act any way we want to other people. And that totally shocked me. It shocked me, and you notice in Vermont or Washington, there is not a common acceptance of principles of guidelines, of ways of acting so things can happen. People can put their agendas and their emotions and their judgments and those can be the chatter that moves things along only with neutrality and only concerns for the highest good. Now, people squint their eyes because maybe that's not what politics is, but it is the vision of how it needs to we have to do things differently. Anyway, Peter Welch kind of gave me a pat and said, Linda, 
don't waste your time, that's not how it works. And uh, so, um, and then I would just tell you my observations. Um, let me just tell you one thing about entrepreneurship. Because I'm in the legislature now and I see the experience that people come from. I think entrepreneurship is the greatest gift for self-growth. You are responsible for a whole system. You can't just you can't just focus on what you know or what you like. You have to grow, and if you don't know it, then find someone else, bring that person into your circle. But you have to see the whole system. And if I can say one thing that doesn't work, um, I'll say in Montpelier, is that there aren't a lot of people that understand the whole system. There are a lot of advocates advocate for this, advocate for that, advocate for that. But there's no one that says, okay, if you want this to happen, well, this is going to bulge out here. How are we going to deal with that? It's sort of a one-sided thing. And as an entrepreneur, founder, or a person that's doing their own business, you've got to look at the whole. And that is the greatest gift. And I know whole, whole systems thinking and in, in um, school, education now is a very big deal, but if you owned your own company, you knew whole systems thinking without knowing what you knew. Um, so, so my observation is that government operates in doubt, and a good company operates from trust. And it's only when you trust good intentions of people can you keep moving and moving <coughs> towards some goals of, of benefit whatever that is. And in, I find in, in Montpelier, it's punitive. It's like, it's like the father, you know, it's like that old vision of the parent, like this, it's punitive. You don't do this so you get a penalty or this and the other thing. People don't trust each other. Don't tell, don't tell them I said this on Twitter. Um, I think I'll be quiet. But think of the concept. Think of that concept and think of the importance of creating trust. So, um, you know, life is not a, a, a straight line, and I just tell you a funny story. When I, when I decided that I might want to do politics after Jagra, I still had this drive to help women. And so, um, I am Canadian, I was born in Montreal, I became an American after war lost, and I said my, you know, I got a vote here, and this country's been so great to me. And someone saw me voting, they said, how come you're voting? You're not American, I said, I'm American. And he said, well, why don't you run for the Senate? I said, okay, I don't know what that is, but well, what, what is it? And um, he said, I'll help you with your campaign, I'll raise money for you, blah, blah, blah. You're a business person, I'm a Republican. Republicans know business. I said, okay, I'll be a Republican. Because you have to know, when you own your own business, I didn't know anything about that. I wasn't paying attention day by day. And so for four days, I was a Republican. I thought, oh, I'm going to teach Republicans about like valuing women and women's rights. I'm going to teach them all about that because we're so similar in business. And then lady called me, Dean called me, and I came home and they said, you're not a Republican, you're a Democrat. I said, they said, do you believe in these values? I said, yes. I said, well, why don't you become a Democrat and teach them business as opposed to trying to transform Republicans? So I am a Democrat. I am a centrist Democrat. I don't really care what party I am, which doesn't really do that well in a dual system where, you know, Republicans and Democrats. But um, so uh, I guess I could. Uh, Michael Ness is going to ask me some questions about being a politician, but I can tell you what I've learned. Um, and this is what I've learned being a... I, I am, by the way, a senator from Chittenden County. I'm one of your six senators. I sit on... I'm vice chair of Senate Economic Development. I care passionately about jobs. My, my passion has shifted to jobs because I think jobs is the essence of a healthy community. And I mean the whole community. So jobs, creation, innovation, what's happening in Champlain College, imperative. It's, it, it's the survival of the state. And I'll tell you what I've been fighting for, arguing about, blah, blah, blah. Um, so 
I've learned patience. I'm much older. I've never done this when I was young. I've got patience now, a little bit. That's my husband. It's gotten a little better. Don't believe her. <laughs> and this, you really have to listen because you're stuck in those rooms. You've got to listen to testimony. Oh, my God. You've got to listen to people that are so wacky. And you can hardly stand it. When you can't stand it anymore, you leave. You go take a walk. You go to the bathroom. You get a coffee. And then you back again. Start again. I'll tell you what I have learned. I have learned about people who don't have as much as some of us do and their struggles. And the, um, the challenge of putting that into a whole system of the balance of the engine and to support the kind of society that we need. So I'm much more attuned to that, and I, I, I must say, my life, I wasn't back then. Um, you meet great people, every day is different, and you, and it's a, I feel like I'm getting my, whatever, Masters of Public Administration, or whatever it is. It's um, mostly interesting, and it drives you crazy. Um, so I was going to tell you a few things that were sort of good legislation, but I, maybe I should just stop for questions now. It's up to you. I mean, we basically reasonably. Okay. Um, well, Mike, yeah, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> well, I consider what you do in the legislature really a philanthropy in a way, because you certainly don't make a lot of money and you, you, you have to deal with some, some. So my question is, in my own mind, is this an effective way to spend your time in the legislature? I mean, I go out there and I see what's going on. And I really say to myself, I think I can have more impact in different ways. You made a different choice, or a choice. I haven't you know, really made a choice, but well, I made a choice. I'm not going to be. About that. How do you get motivated? You're used to running your own show and saying, "I want." Yeah. To oh, that to was. Oh, that, that was. So okay. You, here's the deal. I'm doing my spiritual practice in the legislature, and as one of my friends said, it's a very strange place to do spiritual practice. And what is spiritual practice? Okay, get your ego out of here. Get non-attached. Practice neutrality. Practice compassion. Try and be patient. Try and see the best in people. So I went into a system where it gives me every ample opportunity to practice to be the kind of person I want to be. I've been doing yoga for, I don't know why, I can tell you how many years, but it's over 30 years. And I see, um, and Lily and I are involved with some wonderful deep spiritual wisdom um, with our teacher. So that gives me a grounding in the heavens and reminds me that that there's something to give, and it's my form of service. I'm not a career politician. I don't even know if I'm running again next year. Um, this was an experiment. It was a, it was a gift. It was an experiment. It was kind of a meandering journey. I learned, oh my God, I had to stand on the street corner with my sign. I had to ask people to find I didn't find. And the thing that really bugs me is that advocates come up to you right up to your face and say, do you support this bill, universal health care? What do you think about these things? What do you think about this? And I said, oh, wait a minute. I don't know what you're talking about. This is not the right thing. I'm not going to answer you. And then she looks me right in the face and says, well, my people vote. You know? And I thought, do I? I mean, you know, it's like. <laughs> so I am trying to create my own personal matter. So, Michael, I don't suggest you might call <laughs> <laughs> so let me say that some good things happen and some really stupid and ridiculous things and you look at people and say, do you really think when you die that you're going to say, oh my God, I wish I was elected governor, or oh my God, I wish I was chair of this. People get, you know, we do have career politicians and I think that's not a good thing because you have chairs in our little place and in Washington where they have an opinion and agenda. You cannot get past it. And I think that is atrocious because we have to generate new ideas now. So let me tell you a few. Am I OK? You're fine. You're fine. Okay. <laughs> I want to tell you a few good things, OK? Um, and, and I was, I did this. People, it's taken me eight years to figure out how do I do this well and feel good about it. So 
One is a benefit corporation. It hasn't passed yet, but it passed the Senate. For those of you who are into sustainability, you young people, and absolutely know that values, good values, must be part of any interaction. Otherwise, it's not going to work. You're not going to be prosperous or successful. It just isn't going to work. We're coming into that age where group <coughs> consciousness is more important than individual consciousness. We have to go from stockholder, which is benefit for the personal individual, to stakeholder. And the stakeholder is the community, employees, vendors, communities, whoever is connected to that system of business. So Vermont, if it passes the House, which I think it will, will be the first um, state in the nation to have what we call a benefit corporation, which means that in your charter and bylaws, you say that not only are you going to create a company on board of directors, but this business is for benefit. It's for benefit for others. In order to be a for ben a benefit corporation, you have to have a independent director on the board. That board member is responsible for checking out what the company has done for benefit. It could be reduce your carbon footprint. It could be healthcare for your part-time people. It could be more daycare. It could be, I don't know, whatever. You make it. You do it as a company. You decide what for benefit is. So every year that benefit director has to make sure that a report is put online for transparency so people can see what that company has done for benefit. And it came out of Ben and Jerry's. Those of you who know the Ben and Jerry's uh, story, you know that they went public in the marvelous <coughs> way that they did. They had the triple bottom line, which was very innovative. And Unilever came and offered them a very high price for their stock. Within their corporate charter, it is said that if you, you have to be responsible to your stockholders. So if you can get a very high price for your stock, you have to sell. You have no, you have no legal way to say no. In a benefit corporation, if someone offers, let's say it's a public company, okay, the private too. If someone comes and offers a lot of money for your stock, you can, the board of directors can say, that's a great price for the stock, but it doesn't serve the stakeholders that we are committed to, our employees, our vendors, our communities. And they have a legal way to say no. No, we are not going to sell the company because we are a benefit corporation. This is a very big deal. Small Dog came and um, testified, and he said, this helps me filter um, investors. So if an investor comes to my company, they know what my corporate responsibility, corporate social responsibility is. I, uh, what's his name? Don Myers is uh, planet people, or people planet profit, triple bottom line. So this is, uh, I introduced this bill, I got it through, I feel good about this. Um, Vermont Seed Capital Fund. I am working for your, for you, and for the entrepreneurs. We got stimulus money, and it had to be allocated. Now, you have not seen a cat or dog fight until you get money from the federal government, and everyone has ideas how to spend it. So my idea, <laughs> my idea was, we have to do a seed capital fund for entrepreneurs. It is the entrepreneurs, the tech entrepreneurs, that are going to create jobs for our young people so that my son and daughter, should they want to live here in Vermont, can have good paying jobs. So last year we got $2 million to put in the seed capital fund. This is to invest equity and, um, start, uh, and loans into startup companies. It's housed at the Vermont Center of Emerging Technologies, which is on the Trinity campus of UVM. And we want another $2 million, so that's what we're scrapping with too. But that means that entrepreneurs with a good idea that maybe have you know, a sample, it's not gonna be this in here, it's gonna be technology. But if you have a sample like this, and you need to get it like this to get into the marketplace, that's that first money in, it's very hard to come by. You can 
do it on your credit cards, but it's more than your credit cards. It's going to be like 100 grand. And there's going to be, there's a board of directors, and I'm on it, I was just talking <coughs> to it, who's going to look at these companies and see, to invest in these young people, and we will find some gazelles, like Green Mountain Coffee Roasters, like IDX, like Ben & Jerry's, or Dealer.com, um, those companies that will start producing a lot of jobs. So that makes me feel good, it's been a lot of work, and sometimes I just don't understand how they don't understand how I think about things. <laughs> you know, it is, takes a lot of effort. Um, S44, Common Asset Fund, this went nowhere. But there was a guy, Peter Barnes, who wrote a, 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 a book called Capitalism 2.0. And his premise is that the commons are owned by citizens. The commons are our water, our air, our minerals, our resources. They're owned by us. So um, Alaska actually has a common asset fund. The oil of Alaska is owned by the people of Alaska. And when the, the companies want to drill it and take these natural resources out of Alaska, they pay a leasing fee. <coughs> and that fee goes into a fund, and that fund is used for certain things, but it's also used to pay the citizens of Alaska $1,000, I think they get $1,000 to $2,000 per person. So my idea was let's do it here. Let's say that we have, because think about it, the airwaves, for telecommunication is given to companies. It's our air, it's our airwaves, it's we own it as human beings. But they've been given by the, I don't know who, by the government for to companies, they pay nothing for the medium of the airwaves. So and and look at water. People, there are companies in this state that pull they own the land, but they pull water from their land, but the aquifer is very long. So they're pulling our natural resources out of the ground for nothing. And I say, what company has zero for raw materials? No company has that. So they take the water for free, they ship it to Massachusetts, they bottle it, and then they ship it out. And I say, no, they should be paying us, in a, into a common fund, um, water. They pay for that water. So nothing happened to this, by the way. Um, but we did a groundwater bill, and we finally said that the water, we know that the water above ground is owned by all of us. It's, it's owned federally. That's why we have to have access to water. We can use public waterways. But we, the groundwater bill said that the water below the ground now is owned by Vermonters. They didn't accept my idea that, great, we own it. Let's get some money from the guys who take it out of the earth. Then those, that company came and said, no, 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 we don't want to pay that. So anyway, it's an evolution. And that's a good concept about what's going on. So anyway, you know, Vermont Yankee, we voted against. I wanted to vote for Vermont Yankee because I wanted them to go to the next step, but they were so unethical. And I finally had to go deep down and say, if you don't have a partner that you trust and that's ethical, you can't do business, even if they have a product that might you know, do good for business, and they, they just, right now, they, they are not acting for the common good. It's not win-win, it's win-lose, and I, I can't vote for that. And then marriage equality was a good one, state recognition of Abenaki tribes. I, that was something I wanted to do, is that we had a very rough time recognizing our Native American tribes. It was very complicated, et cetera, et cetera. So I had them for dinner. We started building trust, they bought some food, then we went out together, and they started trusting and working with us, and we got that past the Senate, I don't know if it's gonna go. And that's it, I think the marijuana, I don't think the medical marijuana, I'm one of the sponsors, I don't think, I don't know that it's gonna go anywhere, and um, that's right. But what, one more thing, Green Man Coffee Roasters. I am blessed to be the chair of the Corporate Social, Social as our Corporate Social Responsibility Committee on the board. And I want to say that Fremont Coffee Roasters is a technology company with the K-Cups and that machine. It's an early innovator in fair trade coffee. They treat their employees well. They are such a beaming icon for all of us to look at that when you do good and 
and you offer quality and you treat people well and you go for excellence, you can be very, very, very successful. And those are the kind of <coughs> symbolic working companies that we need to end with.
banks would talk to you. Well, in New York City, you think someone, if I brought two jock straps together, you think they're going to talk to me? No. Only in Vermont. <laughs> yeah. Win. Yeah. Um, put on your, your hat as director of the seed capital fund. And you sort of answered this in your whole talk. And I'm just bring it down. Somebody is coming in front of you, a student with a new idea. What are the critical elements that you want to see presented to you? Well, I think if you're if you're presenting a business plan in front of the seed capital fund, you don't just have an idea. You've gone beyond the idea stage. You have a prototype. You've got to have at least a prototype. So you've 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 leveraged your schooling, BYO biz. You're you've gotten uh, you know your credit cards. You you, you five six thousand dollars to get something. Um, I think. You know, the world ahead of us, uh, technology for renewables, um, anything that's technical that we can export that adds value. And people have got to understand their market. They've got to do the business plan. The wonderful thing about the Seed Capital Fund and the Vermont Center for Emerging Technologies is that they have wraparound services. So you need an accountant, you need a lawyer, you need a marketeer, you need bankers. They surround you with the services that you need to be successful. So I think it's um, I think it's understanding the market, looking at the management team, see how they take in the information. Are they willing to learn? You know, who are they as people? So I'll let you know more. We just had our first meeting. I think we have 48 companies that have made applications to the seed capital. Now, we don't have enough money for all that. I'm hoping we're going to get another $2 million from the stimulus money. We need $5 million because we're going to ask um, investors, like socially conscious investors who believe in entrepreneurship and Vermont, the young people, uh, if we can give them the return, then they might invest in the seed capital fund. So we want to grow it. Yeah. Yeah. Just speaking on that, you know, at one point you were trying to get tax breaks for uh, co-investors, angels, or whatever coming in there. But as, as I understand, that didn't happen. Uh, yeah, it, it did, no. It, it did happen, but it was never used because it didn't happen well. I think what happens in the legislature is that we have good ideas, but because of the sausage-making process <laughs> to get something passed, you start making it less and less and less relevant and it comes out kind of not usable, not practical. So we did try that. So we've been circling around capitalization for young businesses. When you go to all the business associations and schools and what do, what do innovators and people need? They need capital. And it's interesting now because you can't get a loan. You a regular bank, you can't get a loan. So I think there's more motivation to say, let's really use this stimulus money. <coughs> you know, I don't want to tell you about all the waste that happened with the stimulus money, because we're not the brightest grapes in the bunch, or whatever that is, whatever, whatever. A lot of it is, was to keep things the way they were. The Seed Capital Fund is the future. It's about young people, it's about possibilities, it's about job creation. And to me, that's important enough to be patient, to listen to people, to fight for, you know, not forever, just go crazy. Yes? Uh, Linda, you mentioned uh, you just referenced tax policy and concerns. Could you just without spending three hours, yeah, what, what, what are some of the highlights of, of the way the state might change tax policy to help uh, yeah. entrepreneurship and job creation? Well, uh, that's a really sore point for me. I don't know if you know this, but capital gains, we removed the 40% exemption for capital gains. Capital gains exemption to me is so important because it rewards risk capital. If you're going to invest in your own business, if other people are going to invest in, your, in these startup businesses, it's high risk. You know, one out of three go out of business, one out of 10 can create the gazelle 200 jobs that we need. And 
when you invest, you get you get a reward. You know, you get forty percent uh, exclusion, and you pay the rest. <coughs> well, we took that away, except we carved out loggers and farmers. And I have been, I stood up three times in the Senate last year. I have a bill in this year to say businesses, privately held businesses, when they sell and people put all their, and I'm talking about convenience stores, auto mechanics, you know, and our tech entrepreneurs, people put their whole life into their business. And when they sell it, that's their retirement. So I think there's a lot wrong with our tax system and it's, it's, it's just like a, like a bungalow that's been added, 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 added. We have a tax commission that's supposed to look at the whole system. Bill Schubart, Kathy Boyd, and um, Sayers. I can't remember. Yes. Bill Sayers. So hopefully, I spoke to Obi today. I said, listen, these, the, what we're doing now, Obi, Obi, something, Obikowski, He's been there a long, long time. He's head of uh, taxes in the house. He, he needs to find money. I said, listen, you know, people are leaving. Entrepreneurs don't want to start here. There's too many taxes, blah, blah, blah. So he told me today, he said, why isn't business here helping us decide how to do this? So anyone who's in business that wants to come and help, I'm inviting you for lunch. And we'll talk about it. So it's a, it's a lousy tax system, and it doesn't promote the outcomes that we want. And uh, whoever's going to take on, you know, if you when you uh, question the candidates for governor, as young people, you want to know about education, how much money there is. Uh, we have next generation money that's supposed to help young people with workforce training, dual enrollment, so you can be a high school kid and go to college, which Champlain does very well. Uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are good things happening, but ask the candidates for governor about our tax system and how it promotes job creation and conditions for our young people to stay here, to use their creative energy, start families, and to, you know, embrace this place as their home uh, with prosperity. That's what we're looking for. Thank you so much.